Hello, everyone. Um, so uh, welcome to today's cabinet meeting. I want to welcome my fellow cabinet members, councillors um, and members um, of the public. Now, as usual, the full reports are available on the City Council website. Uh, the meeting is being broadcast live on our own YouTube channel. Uh, members of the cabinet, uh, would you please ensure the following? Uh, one, that your sound is muted when you are not speaking. Uh, when you have spoken, please remember to mute your sound again. Uh, when you wish to speak, would you please indicate by using the Zoom raised hand facility, and I'll be able to invite each of you to speak uh, through the queuing system. And please uh, do not use a chat facility unless you have a technical um, issue. So we'll now remove, move on to the formal agenda for today's meeting. So agenda item two is a public forum, and this is a reminder that statements and questions will be taken at the time the relevant agenda item is discussed. And members of the public and councillors will be invited to the meeting at that point. Uh, these have been published on our website as a supplement to the agenda papers, and I will give a reply or ask the relevant cabinet member uh, to uh, respond. Um, can I just remind everyone, please, to behave with due courtesy, tolerance, and respect for one another's views and conduct themselves in a reasonable way. Um, agenda item three, apologies for absence. I have one apology, and that's from Councillor Steve Pierce. I think everyone else is here. So that's the only one. Let's move on now to agenda item four, declarations of interest. So can I ask, Cabinet, if you have any interest to declare here in relation to today's agenda? Yeah, Marvin, on um, agenda item 15, um, I am an employee of CAPTA who are the proposed um, or we're proposing to extension of a contract with one of their systems. So I've had to declare an interest there. Um, I've not been involved in the formation of the paper or any of the background work and I won't engage in the debate. Thanks, Craig. No others? Okay, great. Okay, agenda item five, matters referred for consideration by scrutiny or full council. There were none on this occasion. Agenda item six, reports from scrutiny commissions. There is a report from OSM. Uh, Councillor Jeff Gollop is going to present. Under item six, reports from scrutiny. Under item six, reports from scrutiny. Councillor Gollop, can I ask you to please turn off your live stream as you're now in the cabinet meeting? Councillor Gollop. Hello. Hello. Hi, you are now in the cabinet meeting for item six. Right. I'm just trying to get my screen up. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Marvin. Um, at the OSM meeting on the 8th of July, members agreed to refer a number of items uh, to cabinet. The, the first item is in terms of establishing a number of short life task groups in order to assist the council's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I, I'm gonna mention each of the titles now, but additional details are set out in the, in the appendix to these notes. And I do hope that cabinet members and senior officers will have a chance to look at those in detail. And please, we want, we want feedback because we want this to be part of a constructive exercise and therefore not something that's causing more problems and more challenges, but to be engaging in the process. We anticipate the groups will complete their work in the coming months and we look forward to submitting their, those findings to Cabinet in due course. So Growth and Regeneration are going to be looking at the Emergency Active Travel Fund, uh, resources looking at finance and budget issues, communities looking at the volunteer network response, people looking at safeguarding vulnerable children and health looking at the impact of COVID on planned health care. So those are the items that we, we have in hand and they've been discussed with officers and have been worked up to try and make a, a, a constructive process. We then had three items that are on your agenda for this evening, and I just want to touch briefly on, on those. Um, item 11, City Leap. Members noted that this is an innovative project to attract investment into energy systems over the next 10 years attracted significant international interest, assisting with post-pandemic recovery. Members were supportive of the City Leap scheme and recognised the importance of ensuring the initiative progresses. 
we understand the procurement exercise has been paused and the paper tonight is looking to move that forward to the next stage. But members wanted to revise cabinet that whilst there is cross-party support for City Leap, they would like to better understand the reasons for the delay around the procurement and to be assured that this will not have a negative impact on the potential bidders that have already expressed interest. In view of this, members requested that additional information be provided in a report to either OSM or to Resources Scrutiny Commission, noting that it will most likely need to be shared on a confidential basis. Uh, there are also comments on item 14, the Council Tax Reduction Scheme. Here, members again cross-party agreed that the Council Tax Reduction Scheme should continue, particularly as it will be vital to support those experiencing financial difficulties relating to the pandemic. However, members didn't believe the Cabinet report is sufficiently comprehensive, and therefore there was limited information publicly available to justify ongoing support of the scheme. In view of this, members have asked a report setting out additional information be provided to OSM or resources in the autumn when the financial situation will hopefully be clearer. The final item was uh, in terms of the period two budget report, and we just wanted to note the finance working group uh, report. Um, this is available as appendix B to these notes. I'm, I'm gonna spare you all the details, um, but I just wanted to give a couple of comments. Um, members believe the task group process has worked very efficiently and would like to thank the executive uh, and Craig in particular for their willingness to share information, which will ensure that all findings are robust and fully informed. It's hoped that the collaborative approach to scrutiny will be rolled out more widely on other areas that we deal with. Um, the working group particularly wanted to thank uh, Denise, Michael Pilcher, um, Tian Zinhao and finance business partners for all their support. Uh, thank you for your time, Marvin. That concludes the scrutiny comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So on to agenda item eight, um, alternative learning provision, uh, framework 2016, uh, 20, oh, sorry, I'm supposed to have done agenda item seven, chairs business, uh, no chairs business uh, to share uh, today. Um, now on to agenda item eight, alternative learning provision uh, framework 2016-2021. And can I ask uh, Councillor Anna Keane to introduce this report? Thank you, Marvin. I was a bit worried about my counting then, but it's okay. I've checked it. Um, so this is um, a paper that concerns um, ALP, which is, as it's normally referred to, which stands for alternative learning provision. And it's an ask for Cabinet to note additional expenditure which has taken place and to also grant the ability to extend any existing block contracts for ALP. And this is in the context of a review strategy which is just starting, um, being formed really in the light of our broader work for special, children with special educational needs and disabilities in our city. So just to um, briefly give a bit of context for this, um, alternative learning provision um, provides, it's a, some various settings in our city that provide a very varied and flexible curriculum for children and young people and it exists to meet the needs of children and young people who for a wide range of reasons are unable to access mainstream education and it's often accessed almost always in fact a, a real point of crisis for, for the young person involved and for their families. It's my opinion that the staff that work, the teachers, the support staff, the head teachers of alternative learning uh, providers really are some of the most exceptional people we have working in our city and during this time like all schools have had to adapt so quickly almost overnight to provide a completely different service so, and whereas all schools have some vulnerable children in them in alternative learning um, provision settings all children are vulnerable and they therefore are incredibly skilled and will be people that we absolutely look to in the coming months as we really learn from them about the best ways of nurturing children back into schools during this incredibly difficult time. So um, it's a fairly brief ask really and um, that we have this continuation of, of what we're able to do. Um, it's obviously incredibly important that there's no interruption in this provision for families and for young people um, and it's a you know also comes with a sort of huge thanks for me for the work that's been going on in those settings during this time but obviously also in, in previous years. 
Thank you very much, Anna. So there are no public forum statements or questions. Can I ask any cabinet members if they had comment on uh, this paper? Well, I'll just share one of my own, actually, Anna. And um, I, just since coming in as, as our lead on education and skills, first of all, uh, I think the credibility you brought to the role as a, a professional teacher and an active teacher right now, um, but also uh, some of the challenges you discovered when you're coming in, particularly around SEN and have, ta have taken on. And, um, and it's been huge. It's been, it's been large across the rest of the country as well. But I just want to thank you for the leadership you've um, shown in, in being uh, full and honest in, in, in taking this challenge on. And um, uh, quite rightly, there are uh, many around the city who've not been happy with, uh, with the way uh, uh, their children have been under-resourced. Um, you know, in the past, but um, thank you for leading us to get on top of this. Uh, I wish it's a challenge we'd uh, known about sooner, uh, but we knew once you come in and uh, you're making progress on it. So, um, so uh, thank you. Um, uh, let me hand back to you now, Anna, to take the decision which I uh, support and will now be displayed on the screen. Okay, thank you. Um, so in terms of decision to be made today, I approve the recommendations set out in the report. Thank you very much, Anna. Okay, so let's move to agenda item nine, uh, Community Child's Health Partnership uh, contract. And uh, Councillor Asha Gray is gonna introduce this report. Uh, thank you. So uh, this report today um, is to seek an extension to the current contract that we have with the uh, for Children's Community Health. The contract was awarded to Serona in 2017 on a five year plus an optional five year um, extension. Uh, Serona uh, have been the prime, uh, primary provider and they work in partnership with Bristol Community Health, Avon and Wiltshire Mental Health Partnership and United Bristol uh, Hospitals Bristol. In April 2020, uh, Bristol, uh, the adult community services contract was awarded to Serona. Uh, this meant that Bristol Community Health were unable to continue to provide children's services and therefore from April of this year, uh, their functions and their staff uh, that were carried out by BCH uh, under this current contract transferred uh, to Serona. So Serona have requested um, a decision from commissioners and those commissioners are, the lead commissioner on this is the BNSSG, uh, uh, the CCG for Bristol, North Somerset and South Gloucestershire. And they've, um, and Serona have requested a decision from ourselves to extend the full uh, five years uh, of the contract. Uh, our director of public health has been in close uh, contact with BNSSG and uh, uh, both herself and myself are uh, supportive of the extension. Uh, in addition to extending uh, the contract, we're also uh, seeking additional funding uh, to cover the um, increase in uh, uh, pay, the pay award uh, for staff uh, at 6.5% over three years. So again, it's a pretty straightforward um, request uh, and uh, we want to ensure that public health nursing staff uh, who were funded through uh, the health grant uh, uh, get the uh, award that they deserve. So there you have it. So our request is to uh, agree the extension to the contract uh, for a further five years to 2028 and to request agreement to fund the Agenda for Change pay increase for our public health nursing staff. Thank you. Thanks very much, Asha. So we've had no public forum statements or questions. Any other cabinet members uh, wish to comment on this item? Yeah, thanks, uh, Marvin, if I can. Um, yeah, just very briefly, really, um, to obviously support the um, report. Um, I also welcome the comments from Sirona about aligning the um, children's health element with the adult health element. And I hope so what we see from that is um, is a, a sort of continued alignment between um, 
young people going into adulthood, especially those um, who are vulnerable with additional needs, because I think that's a, a, a big piece of work that we're trying to do across the council and across the city. So if, if these two contracts can can demonstrate that, I think that will be really, really useful, mm -hmm. very, very helpful. Um, and I think it's just worth pointing out that as we um, come into this sort of second phase of of COVID and we start to measure and see the impact of COVID on, on young people as they return to school settings and specifically around their mental health <clears throat> and emotional well-being. I think this contract will be even more important. So, um, you know, we'll be working closely with providers to monitor that. Um, and finally, just to support, obviously, the pay increase for staff over the next three years as well. Thanks very much, Helen. Any others? Okay, well, let me hand back to you now, Asha, to take the decision which I uh, support and will now be displayed on the screen. Okay, so in terms of the decision to be made uh, today, I approve the recommendations as set out in the report. Thank you. Thank you, Asha. So on to agenda item 10, City Centre Development, and Nicola Beach is bringing this uh, report. Thanks, Marvin. Just give me one second. Um, it's a real pleasure to introduce the City Centre Development Plan today, which sets out 23 new placemaking aims and becomes a baseline of planning a more livable city for Bristol in future. Planning documents such as this take quite a lot of time to bring together comprehensively, and this piece of work began back in 2018 um, and followed with a full consultation in 2019. I think it'd be absurd um, not to reference COVID in any conversation about this document today, because of course we sit here feeling the full force of the COVID pandemic, both in terms of its impact on our citizens, how our city is being used both in the day and nighttime economy, and a whole new importance of the public realm that our city is blessed with. It's clear that Bristol is going to be shaped by this pandemic and no one right now can really understand the lasting impact that 2020 will have. But what we do know is that there's still a really significant interest in the revitalisation of our city centre. And this document brings together the interests of the city with landowners and developers to baseline the scale of our ambition for the city centre. Um, but doing the final reviews of the document um, in the last couple of weeks, it is clear in many ways that particularly with the relationship to our commitment with better quality public realm, the pedestrianisation of key parts of the city and the importance of our green spaces, that the pandemic has brought forward our thinking in this space. So if we go back to some of the key objectives of this framework and, and put that through the COVID lens, you can see why um, that relationship is, is so live. Uh, creating a so the first objective is around creating a livable vibrant safe and inclusive city center for people to enjoy both in the day and night second is around tackling traffic congestion improving air quality and making our city center better connected the third goes into supporting the city center as its core retail leisure and cultural heart of, of the west of england and the fourth one is all around then enabling sustainable development of new homes jobs and in the enhancement of our assets uh, heritage assets sorry in public open spaces so you, you start to sort of see that intrinsic link between sort of what the framework sets out to achieve and the city um, as it, a, a, a future city that we may be considering as we go through the COVID pandemic. Um, the framework acts as a reference guide for the beginning of the city that we want to see, as I said, and it promotes a really active east-west connection that city is blessed with um, if you're traveling um, either a, a as a walker or a cyclist, but it also aims to tackle some of the trickier north-south connections that the city center has previously struggled with. The framework also sets out a plan for how public transport and traffic routes will adapt in the city centre. And we're also seeing those changes, as I've already alluded to, in real time with those interventions around the TTROs around Bristol Bridge, which we're sort of able to witness um, then being brought forward much more quickly. The framework it sets the beginning for a much better future and for spaces which for currently feel completely wasted like Castle Park and St James's Park and a lot of work has now started to detail plan uh, to develop detailed plans of how these redevelopment opportunities around those green spaces will come forward in future and um, open to comments and feedback. Thanks Nicola so we've had three statements received um, uh, so I'm going to call on those who are wishing to speak. So we had, we did have statements from uh, Avison Young and Gordon Richardson, who were not intended, who were not attending, but um, they, those statements have been circulated to members. Uh, but Dave Redwell uh, has made a statement and is here. And Dave, uh, you have one minute to make your statement. Thank you. Thanks very much. In principle, um, we support this uh, plan. Um, there's obviously an, um, 
number of concerns we raised at the Bristol Transport Board about need for making sure we got good public transport bus hubs. So you're looking at the issue around the Haymarket, making sure those bus hubs were in place and better interchange with the bus station and the main, uh, main bus routes. We welcome the Bristol Bridge proposals, taking the traffic out of Bristol Bridge and Baldwin Street and now in public transport. We want to make sure that is uh, future-proof for a light rail in the future and uh, rapid transit because I think that's very important. We don't want to spend a lot of money and have to rip all the public ground back up. So I think that's something we need to think about. Um, I think we'd love the mayor to knock over those dreadful buildings in the high street. I think that should be his next part of Temple Meads. The, um, I think they're owned by um, uh, one of the big insurance companies, but uh, the Norwich Union buildings used to be called, but they're in a dreadful state with the Bank of England and it's no uh, gateway to a beautiful historic West Country city. So walking and cycling is very important. Obviously, we would stay again. Public toilets are very important in the city centre. I think we need to make sure the strategy built in there and if we get developer contributions towards that. Nicola, I think that'll be very grateful if they start to pay for some of the public toilet infrastructure in the city centre uh, and private sector. And I think uh, also we need to look at the parks and open spaces. And remember also tourism, it's £1.4 billion economy to the city and therefore it needs to be major in Just the Just 10 seconds, Dave. Okay, and hopefully it's also going to be very inclusive for all the different people who live in the city region. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dave. And obviously we can talk outside of this forum as well to make sure we're capturing the fullness of, of um, your, uh, your, your insights and, uh, you know, and, and thinking. Um, can I ask any uh, cabinet members if they had comment as well? Did I get an indication? So I've got Kai. Oh, wait, right. so I've got a few in the queue here. All oh, right. Um, who have I got there? Oh, uh, Paul. Uh, first of all, Paul. Th thank you, Marvin. And thank you, Nicola, for bringing this um, to, to the council. Um, obviously, I'm speaking here as uh, the local ward councillor for the, for the city centre. And we also uh, got residents involved in the consultation. But when we give this list of all the things that the city centre is in terms of its uh, commercial and leisure use, we mustn't forget that it's uh, an amazing residential area as well. A large number of people uh, live there, and in fact, an increasing uh, number of people. Um, and the the feedback from those those people, I think, has has been reflected in in the document that's come out. M my my issue is that what we can't do is let the continuation of this process, which I think is absolutely crucial, act as a um, something that creates stagnation in terms of new development coming forward. Um, it's really, really important, as, as has been said, post-COVID, uh, that we do continue to push forward with the development of the, of the city centre, which does mean the change of the city centre. I think we're going to see uh, less retail and more leisure uh, and, and more residential in terms of what the, the centre will look like. We know that there are major pre-apps in already, uh, including uh, St Mary Laporte, and it's really, really important that we don't frustrate those documents, uh, those applications, that we try and run them in parallel with this process rather than sequentially after the, the process, because that could uh, add another two years of delay into uh, the redevelopment of the city centre, which is two years that we can't afford given the, the situation of the uh, economy and the way in which COVID is accelerating uh, the change in, in city centre uses. So I very, I very much welcome this. I very much welcome the comments um, that, that Nicola has made and, and hope we can all get behind um, this process, but also to keep the motor running on developments as they come forward. Thanks, Paul. I think, Kai, did you want to come in as well? Yeah, thank, thanks for that, Marvin. Yeah, uh, so I'm not going to uh, repeat what Paul said there, but I think I'll focus on, which I agree with, uh, obviously the transport issues in the city centre. And um, it's, it's been a delight to bring some of those plans forward and uh, get, them, get them in as quickly as possible. As you say, the normal process is to take a few years to get some of these changes in. So it's, it's good to um, see them starting to go in on the ground now. And I'm being told by officers that the Bristol Bridge situation should be introduced in August. So um, that would be, you know, really positive to see. And it's, it's probably a good month to start that, given that the, you know, the traffic's lower anyway. Um, and the other, the other important thing in the area is um, obviously the city centre's main park, Castle Park. I think it, it needs a large amount of investment in it, given the um, 
obviously the extra weight of population that's going into that area as, uh, as the number of residents incre increases, but also it's always been the part for workers who go there at lunchtime and things like that. So it's not only a part for residents, it's, you know, a part for people that visit the area and work in the area. And I think um, any investment that goes into Castle Park as, as part of this process will be um, warmly welcomed. But thanks anyway. Thank you. Thanks, Kai. Uh, and I'll hand back to you as well, Nicola. But also just to say my thanks for the work, uh, thanks for the work you've been doing here. Um, just proactively grabbing hold of our, our city centre. Across the core cities, it is one of the um, one of the, the, the ongoing issues uh, we face, particularly going to this economic downturn on top of the um, uh, the pressures that were on retail and high streets beforehand anyway, as to how we work with government to make sure that we protect the future of our city centres, reinvent them, reshape them, re-deliver them so that they they are sustainable. Um, so yeah, thank you for um, thank you for your work on this. But let me hand back to you now to take the decision which I support and will now be displayed on the screen. It's a lot, Marvin. Um, in making the, this, this decision, I have taken into consideration the consultation process and the equalities impact assessment in the report. In terms of the decision to be made today, I approve the recommendations as set out in the report. Thanks, Nicola. Uh, so let's move on to agenda item 11, City Leap Procurement. And uh, Kai, you're going to bring this paper. Yeah, th thank you, Marvin. Um, so, um, yeah, th thanks, everybody. C City Leap. Um, I'll just go into a bit of background for those of you that um, obviously are unaware what the, the, the project's about. Um, the, the level of investment that's needed in the city to decarbonise the, the economy is, is, is vast. I think um, in our One City Environment Board report, we worked out that to decarbonise the energy system of Bristol, you're talking at least about four billion five billion pounds to, to do that piece of work. Obviously, um, that's a very um, early figure that we've come up with, but 4.5 billion, 5 billion, whatever it is, is a significant amount of investment. If you look at what the government are offering at the moment, they've made a recent announcement around an economic stimulus around energy investment. That was three billion pounds for the whole country. So per head of population, that works out at around 45 pounds per head. When in Bristol to decarbonise the energy system per head of population, that investment is around nine thousand pounds. So the gap between what is on offer from government and what's needed is is, is massive. And the City Leap Energy Programme is um, a way of trying to bridge that gap between the amount of investment that's needed and the amount of investment that's on offer from government. So we think through this process we can attract around about a billion pounds of that investment into the city to decarbonise the energy system and support us with the 2030 carbon neutrality goal and obviously um, help us along the road in terms of our ob objectives around fuel poverty. Um, obviously, that level of investment into a city is going to be great for jobs, um, skills and the economic boost to the, to the city. Um, and we're quite well placed in Bristol to, 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 to uh, deliver this. Um, we've got an excellent, excellent energy service within the council, delivered a number of projects ac across the city around heat networks and insulation, solar panels, wind turbines. So we've got a great level of expertise in the council. So the City Leap Energy Project um, is a way of delivering that invest trying to deliver that investment in the city. And what we've come up with um, is a um, preferred option of a joint venture partnership. So this is on the back of a prospectus that went out in 2018 um, about all the potential in investable energy opportunities in the city that went out around the world seeking interest and in, um, potential partners. And we had 180 expressions of interest back of major organisations from around the world that want to work with Bristol to deliver that decarbonised energy system. We, had a, um, we then had a bidder's day in September 2019 because um, we by that point, we've come up with a preferred model of how we, we're going to take this forward, which is a joint venture partnership between um, a preferred bidder and, um, and the city council. So we had 70 organisations at the bidder, Bidder's Day. We then got that down to a shortlist of eight potential organisations by March this year. Um, we had a round of um, negotiations with those people 
free free face to face meetings with each organization over a six week period based on that um, that feedback um, we've decided to um, restart that phase of the city leap energy program which is the procurement phase because based on that feedback we intend to make changes to the procurement process and those changes would would have been um, material and somebody who hadn't bid that might have bid based on those changes could could then challenge the process so the legal advice was that the lowest risk thing to do was to start a new procurement process with obviously the changes that we we want to introduce based on the the feedback that we've um we've got from the from the market and those eight eight final bidders um so there, there's going to be a little bit of a delay but we still expect to appoint a uh, a strategic partner to take forward that investment over a 10 to 20 year period um in um mid uh, sorry summer next year summer 2020 uh, summer 2021 um, I think based on the feedback as well from the from the bidders, the, the proposition is going to be much better anyway. It's going to be a much better proposition for the city and also for, for the partner that comes in. Thank, thanks for that, Marvin. I commend the report. Thanks, Kai. So um, we've had one public forum statement and 10 questions. So I'll call on those who have indicated they wish <laughs> to speak. So the statement is from uh, Councillor Jeff Gollop. So, Jeff, you have a minute. I'll give you a 10 second warning. OK, thank you, Marvin. Um, at the June cabinet meeting, you told me the second EY report cost £440,000 funded by Bristol Energy. Next morning, I had a correction and the figure was now 145 k Now, if I look at the public record, I see under the description City Leap Prospectus, EY were paid four amounts in May, totaling £551,504 or net of VAT, 442K. Remarkably close to Marvin's first answer of 440K. One of those payments was 145K coded to the prospectus. Exactly the figure given in Marvin's corrected answer. Which one's correct? If the lower figure, we need a detailed explanation of why the council paid the amount when the mayor said the energy company paid it. If the payments to EY were all for City Leap, why were they billing us for work at a time when the report tells seconds, the procurement yeah. was suspended? Why were we paying them so much? I find myself questioning why none of this adds up to a truthful explanation. Uh, you. I urge you to use the response to questions on this issue to provide a full and credible explanation of what has happened. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Okay. So um, let's move on to questions now. Um, and the first question is from Jeff Gollop. Jeff. Thank you, Marvin. So the first question is, how much of the, uh, the 6.5 million uh, of City Leap procurement costs, how much of that was and will be paid to EY split by financial year? I think right, so I, to... Yeah, I'll, I'll come in on that. Um, so so I, I think that's your two questions in one, one package there, isn't it, Jeff? So um, no, that's question one. Question one is it? So, question one is how much of the six point five million was or will be paid to EY? So, the so the answer to that question is that in the 2019-2020 financial year, EY was paid four hundred and ninety-two thousand one hundred sixty-three pounds from the City Leap budget. Seventy-five thousand pounds of that was for the BE report, and I think um, the, the the story behind that original figure was obviously it was. Um, made in error, but we, we corrected it very quickly the next day. So we, we accept that the, um, the figure you were given before was, was incorrect, but this, uh, and it was corrected the next day very quickly by the, by the mayor's office. So, um, Did you have a follow-up question? Uh, well, I'm still slightly bemused because you gave me the figure for 1920, um, but... Well, should we go on to your second question? So your second question, Jeff, is how much has been paid to EY in the current financial year? Right, and then I'll come back with supplementaries after that. So, so in the 2021 financial year, at the end of May, approximately £20,000 has been uh, incurred in relation to the, to the City Leap. An additional 90000 balance has been paid for the BE report. Uh, the budget forecast for City Leap includes a budget of £225,000 in 2021 and £150,000 
in 21, 22 for financial advice. None of this budget, other than the £90,000 referred to above, is in relation to uh, Bristol Energy. So, Jeff, you have two supplementary questions? Yeah, first of all, can I, can I have uh, those answers in writing, please? So I, I'm, I'm trying to understand how that ties up with the public statement of payments over £500 to Ernst & Young, which reflected, as I said in my statement, £550,000 paid to them during the course of May. Right, well, th those are the figures I've been given by the team, Jeff, and I'm um, obviously more, more than happy to uh, get, get that to you in writing. Do you have another supplementary? So, in which case, can, can I have that reconciliation in writing, and can I also have an explanation because if the payments were made for, by Bristol Energy from its own resources, as I was assured at the last cabinet meeting, I don't understand why the payments are coming through as city council public payments because they so should what would have be, been what, made what would be um, incredibly helpful, Jeff. So if we've got your questions here, if you can actually write your questions down and make them as clear as possible, and as specific as possible rather than in general, then we'll be able to come back to you with those written answers. Is that okay? Um, that was a fairly specific answer that I would have thought followed on from, from what I was asking, but I will do that and look forward to the answers being published. Yeah. Clear questions to help give clear answers. So that'd be uh, fantastic. Okay. So let's move on to uh, Councillor Steve Smith. Uh, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Marvin. Um, my, my question is, is very simply, what is the change that's being made to the city leak procurement? What is it that we are now proposing to procure that we weren't before or vice versa? Right, thanks, Steve. I'll, I'll give you the answer now. Um, there are a number of elements during the procurement process that have become clearer. These include the fact that there's no, there is now no specific energy provider. There are other, other elements that will change, but these are all financial and parts of a ongoing negotiation on the basis of that, and to ensure we don't prejudice the conservation uh, conversations and stay within public contracts regulations, um, the, the Act 2015, I don't intend to re, uh, record those in a public meeting. However, I'm happy to confirm that we'll meet OSM's request and um, detail these these in a, in, a, in a closed session. I think uh, Jeff um, raised that in his statement at the, the start, and we're happy to do that. And that's obviously a more appropriate place to um, to reveal that. Um, the level of ambition for City Leap remains the same, and the initiative will continue to play a significant role in addressing the climate emergency, ensuring that Bristol is well equipped to achieve carbon neutrality by 2030. The ob objectives for City Leap in terms of transforming Bristol's energy system and delivering unprecedented social environmental and economic benefits for the people of Bristol. So you have two supplementaries, uh, Councillor Smith. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, so if I understood that correctly, essentially the energy company was part of what this a partner was going to buy and now it's not, um, currently if I got that wrong. So can you give us an outline, and I, I appreciate there's commercial issues you can't go into in public, but an outline of what it is that the uh, joint venture partner will be getting what what are they buying into in return for what's hopefully a significant investment well no, nothing's nothing's changed on that steve is obviously um you know as a joint joint venture partnership on at least a 50 50 basis to decarbonize the energy system of bristol obviously the council's very well placed in the city with it with, with its position around um, asset ownerships and um its trusted position in the city and um, that, that's what the, you know, the, part, the partnership that a preferred bidder will be buying into, that position to come in and jointly with, with the council and the people of Bristol decarbonise the energy system. Um, and it's important that we, we do this because the amount of change that's going to be required to, um, to the energy system and um, to, to de decarbonise decarbonize the city is going to be vast and it's and is important that we do it in a way that brings people with us and the investment and the benefits of that are shared with the people of Bristol, with communities, and we get the full benefit of that change. Your second supplementary. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I, I, I completely support the ambition and, and what it's trying to achieve, and I get the need for, for a partner to invest in that. What I'm trying to understand, and forgive me if I've not 
not got this, is if I imagine for a moment that I had many millions of pounds to invest in this, um, when I put that money in, in order to decarbonize Bristol, I'm going to want to own something at the end of it. There's going to need to be an asset that I jointly own with the council. I'm trying to understand what that asset is. Well, there's a number of scenarios, um, and uh, a lot a lot of this is subject to the negotiations with with the um, shortlisted um, bidders. So there's a number of ways it could work. Um, what what is clear is that there will be a joint venture partnership to take some of these investment investments forward. How that is then sort of developed, and how that then works out in practice, there's a number of different scenarios that it, and ways it can be done. Um, and part, you know, we don't want to be too specific on, on that, really, because part of the, the offer is that a potential bidder brings potential solutions to the table. Um, so, we're, we, you know, we want to keep it as flexible as possible so we can, you know, we've got a good negotiating position. We can get the, the best possible deal for Bristol out of the partnership. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, the point you make, Councillor Smith, is... Uh is is one we've been wrestling with beyond city leap as well i was on a call with c40 just uh, uh last week actually um which is the global network of cities really really holding up the the front end on climate change where national governments are failing and uh one of the one of the points i made there and at a recent uh, seminar i was on with the world economic forum was about the need to attach finance to city uh, reconceptualization replanning and rebuilding so that we're low impact, low carbon things, right? Our systems, our waste system, transport system, energy system, all needs to be decarbonized. That takes billions of pounds uh, to do it. So, so it's a grapple we're trying to take on. And if it's a conversation that you're interested in being a part of, you'd be welcome um, to come and talk to us, uh, uh, you know, about those, you know, have some conversations about new kinds of finance that will enable cities to do that. Because national governments are, or certainly our national government is failing to come up with the money necessary to support that transition. Okay, so let's move on to uh, Councillor Thomas, Jerome Thomas. Um, can you ask your first question, please, Councillor Thomas? Uh, yes, I'm wondering what value that has been achieved for the city um, in the, of the 4.2 million spent up to the end of March on the failed procurement exercise. Well, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't say as a failed procurement exercise because you know it's a, it's a it's a program that's ongoing and uh, we're going to deliver on it. So I, f I think the premise of that is, is, is wrong. Um, the upfront investment to this point has been significant and has the potential to unlock the delivery. We think of around a billion pounds of investment into uh, low carbon energy pro um, projects in the city. And obviously it supports the path for, for Bristol to become carbon neutral by 2030. So I think, um, I mean, it's a groundbreaking uh, project. You know, I, don't, I don't think any other city is doing this. And I think what we're trying to deliver, at least around a billion pounds over the lifetime of the, of the project, is worth the upfront investment. And, um, I mean, just to go back to, I, I know um, Councillor Smith was um, obviously casting his eye over this, but the reality is, is that, you know, we need, we need the investment to come in to do this. I mean, it'd be great if the government was offering us that £4.5 billion pounds. But the reality is they're not. Um, the, the money they've offered is cosmetic. Um, you know, as I mentioned at the start of my report, the latest um, investment in insulation is £45 per head of population. When to deliver that full decarbonisation of Bristol, we're talking about a £9,000 per head investment in, into the city. So the, um, the gap between the rhetoric and the delivery is, um, is, ma is massive from the government. So um, the, the purpose of this project is to deliver that investment through other means because the government isn't uh, stepping up. And it's a way that we main con main maintain control and trust um, because, the, uh, as I said in my previous answer, the, the level of the intervention that's um, required is going to be vast. So it's important that we maintain the trust of the, um, of the, of the population. Can I, do you like to ask a supplementary or go on to your second question, Councillor Thomas? Um, go on to the second question, then I'll, then I'll ask my supplementaries. So, uh, so, yeah. Do you want me to answer that first or do you want to... Yeah, if you could, Kai, please. Thank you. Right, OK. Uh, there you go. Well, we've got, you know, we've got to take these uh, challenges seriously. Um, and I, I suppose, well, you, I, I think the Green Party do, don't they, or... 
Are, are they absolutely more interested in? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's hard to tell because it seems you know from the question that it's, you're more interested in uh, sort of peddling some untruths and political point scoring. But I think, I mean, this is the kind of issue that really should be should be above that. Um, I mean, the council's got um, an opportunity to develop a wide range of um, low carbon energy infrastructure across across its, its um, estate. As I mentioned to, to Steve Smith, this will uh, be a trigger for City Leap to deliver similar projects across the city in um, private and commercial sectors. Bidders who um, took part in the first procurement exercise have con confirmed they remain interested in all, all eight that made it through to the shortlist have confirmed with us that they they're still interested in the in the in the process so your supplementary councillor thomas yeah i mean first of all Kai, i mean i think your answer to steve that really the detail of what might be sold is going to be dealt with in closed session is very disappointing i think we've seen that the level of secrecy around bristol energy and the lack of collaboration has resulted in huge losses for the city and yes, I'm agreeing, but I really want value for money for the city, um, as do we all. Um, and the secrecy and lack of collaboration is we not just get to your question, value for money. It's, yeah. It sounds more like Councillor Thomas. Is, is, it, is it a speech or a question you'd like to uh, put forward? Yeah, I've, I've got a question. Okay, can you, can, you get to the, can you get to the question, please? Um, I mean, I think the concern is that City Leap is, you say it's a groundbreaking project, but this emperor has not got any clothes is the fear. Um, and I really would like to know why it is, I mean, the mayor said that um, he would not have gone into Bristol Energy because um, he didn't think it was a good investment for the city. Um, you know, three years ago, Marvin was in China touting City Leap, and we've had no progress and millions of pounds spent. Why is it the right thing to get involved in City Leap when it so obviously to the mayor was not the right thing to get involved in Bristol Energy. Well, I, uh, I, I mean, um, I just, I just tackle a few, few of the points that you've made there. Just in, in terms of, I mean, I object to the, um, the, the fact that you, you know, say we're handling this in, in secret. I think the rea reality of a procurement process and where commercially sensitive negotiations are taking place is not about just keeping it a secret. So we can hide what's going on is about having a strong negotiating position and not giving away our hand. So the, uh, the taxpayer of Bristol gets the best deal. Um, I think if we laid all our hands on the table, uh, you know, it may advantage one bidder against another and we, you know, we don't, we don't get the best, best deal. The best way to scrutinize that is, is via a closed session. And, you know, we've, um, we've offered that and that, I think that's the best way to proceed. And that is in the interest of the public of, of Bristol because, um, we want to get the best deal and it, laying all our cards on the table before you go into a negotiation isn't the best way of getting a deal. I don't know if you've had experience of negotiations before, Jerome, but, you know, I've, I'm, I'm, I've been a trade union official for, for a number of years now and you, you don't uh, give, your, give your hand away before you go into a negotiation. So sometimes in the interest of the, um, the taxpayer, you have to operate in this way. And just in terms of um, Bristol Energy, obviously, you know, when we, when we um, inherited it, had 15.8 million pound um, allocated to it, uh, uh, an allegedly robust um, business plan, and um, it was signed off on a on on a cross party basis, including uh, members of the Green Party that were in the cabinet at the time, and also um, obviously Jeff Jeff Gollop as well, who was the the cabinet member for finance at the time. He was obviously taking a, a new a new interest in Bristol Energy now, and so slightly shifted his position on it. I mean, there, there is a YouTube video available of that cabinet meeting that signed off the investment in Bristol Energy that that was uh, made available recently. So, I mean, you can you can you can watch that back if you if you want. But um, the investment in Bristol Energy was a um, you know that was backed by the Green Party. It was backed by Jeff Gollop. Um, so um, to to now try and distance yourself from it is quite 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 strange. Um, in terms of City Leap, what we're dealing with is investment into energy infrastructure, wind turbines, solar panels, heat networks, things that things that stand up properly. I mean, that's what we should have gone into from the start, in my, in my opinion. Thank you. Thanks. Did you have a supplementary, uh, your second supplementary, Councillor? <laughs> no, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, yeah, so it, it's really important, again, for the sake of the quality of our political discussion, not to um, fast and loose with the descriptions we have of people's position, uh, particularly mine. So it'd be, it would help us if we do that, particularly with an issue as critical as climate emergency and ecological emergency. And, and what we do as a city, as really as a forerunner, city in this country and you say globally in terms actually in terms of trying to transform our relationship with the energy systems um so yeah it'd be great if we can if we can enter into that kind of uh, behavior politically and and show the rest of the city how it's done not just behave like we're on twitter okay let's uh, move on to the next uh, question now i think i've got anthony negus anthony negus is not with us okay anthony negus not with us uh, councillor hiscott Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, I think you have the question in, in front of you. Um, yeah. So the weekly payments of agency staff in May, um, could you just tell us what role or roles um, these payments relate to? So the payments relate to the City Leap Programme Manager, a highly experienced project ma uh, management professional in, in, employed through our guidance guidance, sorry, our um, agency partner. So it's just one role? Yeah. Thank you. And then um, question two, how many staff are included in the core teams of um, BCC staff? So the uh, core, core teams for City Leap comprises the following. Um, in terms of Bristol City Council staff, three permanent members of staff, including the head of City Leap, who has day-to-day -day responsibility for man managing the program and reports to the senior responsible officer, which is um, Stephen Peacock, and um, also reports into the City Leap project board, which I'm, which I'm a member of. Uh, the City Leap project support manager, who is um, part of the program management office, office. The City Leap partnerships manager, who is responsible for promoting City Leap to the market and engaging external stakeholders. So they're, they're, they're the um, Bristol City Council staff. In terms of agency, um, obviously only the City Leap program manager that we, uh, we talked about previously. And obviously you've got internal professionals that support the program, colleagues from uh, legal, finance and procurement who provide advice and support to the program. Uh, the numbers of which vary over time, depending on the nature of the advice and support required. So you have two supplementaries, Councillor Hiscott. Yeah, thanks, Kai. Can I have that in writing as well, please? That'd be great. Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I just would like your opinion on this. I mean, we've, we're trying to be very um, clear about the cost of project. Um, because would you agree that um, the, cab the previous cabinet allocated around 15 million to Bristol Energy, but actually the costs are now well above 37 million, and that actually we need to be very careful with taxpayers' money? Of course, yeah, we always need to be careful with taxpayers' money, but I think this is um, a good investment for the taxpayer. If we can invest a small amount of money up front and deliver, you know, um, a level of investment around a billion pounds over a number of years back into the city, decarbonizing the energy system, creating jobs, providing the demand for new skills so people can take opportun the opportunity to reskill and upskill given the, given the changing nature of the economy. Um, I think, I think it's um, a great investment if it, if it can be delivered. Do you have a second follow-on question? Councillor no, second question, thank you. Thanks, Kai. Okay, thank you. Okay, so our next questioner is Councillor Weston. So, Councillor Weston, can you ask your first question, please? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, obviously, you've got my, my two questions. Um, can you provide a breakdown and definitive total figure for the sums paid to Ernst uh, Young for both of their reports and the engine company? Now, I think Kai answered this in an earlier question, but you've obviously got Sorry. my two questions. Yeah, so there's um, been two EY reports in relation to Bristol Energy, costing a combined total of 165,000. Okay, thank no, you. Um, one question? Yeah, your second question or your supplementary? Or... No, Did I'll you have a supplementary on that? 
Do you want a second question? Okay, second question. Uh, right, here we go. So uh, let me see. Okay. Um, there's no commonality between those working on the city elite procurement process and those who have worked on uh, Bristol Energy. Obviously, including uh, Jeff Gollop, who was obviously used to work on Bristol Energy. I don't think that's quite true, but okay. Um, my supplementary then is I understand um, certainly when City Leap was originally drafted and NG of business reports were originally drafted, there was some commonality in the authors. Now we're seeing what's happening with Bristol Energy, um, and I'm nervous about similar things happening with the uh, Leap Prospectus because I actually would prefer that would work. So absolutely you're convinced they are separate. We're not going to be having similar repeats. So um, from, my, from my point of view, it's um, an energy service led project, uh, which has been led by David White, who's got no um, obviously d direct connection to, to, to Bristol Energy, which is obviously a separate company of Bristol City Council. Um, and the, the governance structures are completely, completely separate. So, um, yeah, there's no, no connection. I'll email you in private on that one. Um, in that case, my second... <clears throat> refers to the wider city leap initiative um what is our total exposure and i'm happy to have this in writing at a later later date um our total exposure if something goes wrong if we have a, a similar problem what is the total exposure and I, I don't expect you have that on your on your top of your head now i'm happy to have it after the meeting well well there's um there's a figure to how much in total the program is going to cost to get us through the procurement process. And then obviously um, uh, what, what the project delivers um, is um, obviously, obviously down to negotiations, isn't it, between the, the shortlisted, shortlisted bidders. And um, I mean, from the, from the shortlist of eight, they're very, very serious players in the, in the energy industry. People with deep pockets that are going to come, that would come in and um, deliver on those promises and investments. So, um, um, from from the list of people I've seen, I'm not I'm not too worried, and I think um, energy infrastructure. I mean, it's needed. It's a safe, long term, secure investment. So I don't I don't see um, the similarities with the energy retail market, which is a kind of the wild, the wild west. And obviously, back in 2015, people should have known better about going into that that wild west environment. Okay, yeah. thank you very much, uh, Councillor Weston. If you want to. Pursue any questions outside of cabinet. I'm sure um, we're happy to to talk to you there. Okay, um, so let me come back now to cabinet. Any cabinet members like to comment on this item? As a, that was a good chunk of time, Kai. Thank you very much <laughs> for all the work you've been uh, got around, doing on this. Yeah, yeah, the the single most. Uh, in, yeah question the examined item for today, and and in many ways, quite rightly, uh, such a. Uh, a significant issue uh, for the city and uh, and the country's um, role in climate change as well. So uh, let me hand back to you now, Kai, to take the decision which I support and which will now be displayed on the screen. Thank you. In making this decision, I've taken into consideration the equalities impact assessment in the report. And in terms of the, the decision to be made today, I approve the recommendations as set out in the report. Thank you, Kai. Um, you're back now um, for agenda item 12, highway electrical assets contract. Yeah, I'm very surprised. No, no questions on this one. It's always, uh, always su surprising, isn't it? Um, yeah, the, uh, the, thanks, Marvin. Yeah, the purpose, um, sorry, the purpose of this report is to seek approval to tender a new highways electrical contract for initial four years, 2021 to 2025 with the possibility of a further extension of two years, 2025 to 2027, followed by a further possible extension of two years, 2027, 2029. Uh, the current level of expenditure under the contract is uh, 1.4 million pounds per, per year, consisting of 800,000 pounds revenue expenditure and 600 pounds grant funding and capital expenditure. Additional works, have been, will need to be procured to um, deliver additional capital planned infrastructure under the approved capital program, e.g. for the clean air zone and grant funded sustainable trans transport schemes. The new contract value 
stroke ceiling is uh, an estimated £2.5 million a year uh, with a guaranteed expenditure of a million pounds per year. Um, and obviously we've got that headroom to um, to cover us for sort of one-off requirements that might might be required over the lifetime of the, the contract. Um, and obviously the gen- general purpose of the contract is to ensure all electrical assets are monitored and maintained in, in accordance with legislation, um, which is quite an important um, bread and butter issue to deal with as a, as a council. Um, there's also benefits around, ongoing benefits around um, uh, making sure that the um, energy efficiencies and things like that are up to up to scratch with lighting, etc. Um, and obviously, it is very a very important thing to to keep an eye on and keep on top of. It's obviously improving the lighting of our roads and footways, ensuring that people are well connected, is an important job of the of the council. So it's a um, contract to um, look after look after that part of the work that the council does. Thanks, Kai. Um, Thank you. As you said, no question statements. Any cabinet members to speak on this one? Okay, let me hand back to you now, Kai, to take the decision, which I support, and is now being displayed on the screen. Thank you. Um, in making this decision, I've taken into consideration the equalities relevance check in the report, and in terms of the decision to be made today, I, I approve the recommendations as set out in the report. Thanks, Kai. Thank um, so... Let's go on to agenda item 13 now, uh, South Bristol Light Industrial Workspace. And Councillor uh, Craig Cheney's uh, bringing this report. Thanks, Martin. Apologies, I've had to keep my camera off because my battery's running out, so I'm not trying to save battery. Um, yeah, so thank you. Affordable small to medium scale light industrial workspace units are important to support growing small businesses in locations outside of the centre of the city, and in particular in South Bristol. The Fillwood Green Business Park was opened in May 2015 to address this kind of need, but has been operating at pretty much capacity since December 2016, with its secure light industrial units being particularly in demand. There's presently a lack of supply of new industrial stock across South Bristol and pressure on existing industrial areas from housing and other important uses. Continued demand is expected into the future. An important local market driver for South Bristol is to accommodate and support the continued growth of light industrial creative and construction related businesses to those that provide a supply chain to the Bottle Yard Studios. In parallel with the South Bristol Enterprise Advice and Support Project, which we brought to Cabinet a few months ago, this will help promote and strengthen enterprise culture and economic opportunities in outer South Bristol. There is a strong strategic case to expand the workplace infrastructure for growing small businesses using the available public grant funding um, and ERDF funding and WECA investment funding. And so in September 2019, the Council placed an outline bid for 1.2 million from South Bristol Sustainable Urban Development European Regional Development Funds and for development of up to 2,300 square metres of light commercial business units. The outline bid was approved in December 2019 and the Council has been invited to submit a full application. The RDF funding is proposed to be match funded by a bid to the West of England Combined Authority for up to 2.7 million. Initial feasibility and site options appraisal work has identified 601 Whitchurch Lane as a preferred development site. The site is council owned with an existing building which has reached the end of its economic life and would benefit from replacement. The site is directly adjacent to the Potter Yard Studios and it's proposed that access between the sites will provide connectivity for businesses providing film and TV production support functions, as well as access to available facilities such as meeting and training space. If successful, this project will provide new enterprise infrastructure and facilities to meet the needs of startup and growing SMEs in South Bristol. And especially given its location at Witch Church Lane, existing businesses and new entrepreneurs based in the outer regeneration area centred on Hengrove and Witchurch Park, Parkcliffe and Willie Wood and Fullwood Wards, where there's been a growing pressure of demand for affordable, modern, small industrial units. So I'm asking Cabinet to agree that we submit the next stage bid and if successful, draw it down to deliver on some of our core principles, inclusive growth, improved resilience, particularly in South Bristol, as well as helping us to support the Bristol climate strategy. Thank you, uh, Craig. So we've had no public forum statements or questions. Can I ask any of the um, cabinet members if they'd like to speak to this one? I've got uh, Nicola and Paul and Helen, actually. So should we go in that order, Nicola? I'm happy to make way for, I feel like Paul and Helen are more expertise in South Bristol than me. I just want to say congratulations, Craig. I think it's a great idea. And um, having been involved in the economic studies in South, and the importance of jobs in South Bristol, I think it's really good to see it here today. Okay, so why don't I come to Paul and give the last word to Helen? Okay, uh, th- uh, thank you, Marvin, and, and thank you, Craig. I think this is an, uh, an excellent report that's been brought forward. But you, it wouldn't surprise you to set, for me to say how this links to the Hengrove Park 
residential development. During that um, development period, we had a, a large number of people saying to us, we want jobs in South Bristol, not houses. I think what the action that, you, that you're announcing today shows that we can have both and that our commitment to providing new jobs and workspace within South Bristol is absolutely as strong as our commitment to helping to meet the housing need that we've got there. And that this will strengthen, I think, the offer of the housing in Hengrove and hopefully we'll have lots of people working in this new development which will, who will be walking to work from the new homes that we're building. Great, Helen, so can we hand it to you now, please? Yeah, thank, thanks, Marvin, and um, totally agree with what, what Paul's just said, and well done, Craig, on bringing this report. And I think the to make a hub around the bottle yard, obviously there may, be, may well be um, local businesses, local entrepreneurs who link with the film industry, who who might use those spaces in the future. So that's really quite exciting. The only other point I wanted to make is, is that, um, you know, that famous phrase, build it and they will come, but actually people do need to have their hands held to come there. So I think I think what we need to make sure is that when, when it comes off, that we actually have that parallel piece of work that supports people in creating their own businesses and uh, in employing other people them, themselves so that we don't just think, well, there it is, come on, long, come along and use it, but that we do all that, all that work developing that as a vision for employment in the future, because I'm sure it will be much more important in the post-COVID world. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Helen. Helen. I mean, it's probably it's probably a fair point. So we did have the South Bristol Enterprise Support Programme, which we launched a few months ago, does exactly do that actually. And and if we if we can make sure those two things are logic or combined logically, then then that should flow through anyway. So you're completely right. And I, I think we've got that in place, but we just need to make sure that we're intentional about it. Okay, thank you all. So let me hand back to you now, Craig, to take the decision which I support and is now being displayed on the screen. Just remember my wording for uh, making the decision. In making this decision, I have taken into consideration the consultation process and the equalities impact assessment in the report. In terms of the decision to be made today, I approve the recommendations as set out in the report. Thank you, Greg, and thanks for bringing this item. So let's stay with you now for Council Tax Reduction Scheme Agenda Item 14, uh, Council Tax Reduction Scheme 2021-22. Thanks, Marlon. So. Uh, I I don't need much introduction. As everyone knows, we need to um, say so we offer a council tax reduction scheme in Bristol, 100% fully funded for people who cannot afford to pay their council tax. Um, but one of the few core cities left in the, well, in fact, the only core city left in the country that does it. Um, we are obliged to review that every year. And um, so it's that time again, the time of year has come around where we need to start thinking about this. It needs to form part of our council tax base um, decisions that we make later in the year. So. So uh, we need time to make this. We also, if we were proposing changes, there, there is a long consultation period that we need to go through. However, we don't intend to um, change the council tax reduction scheme this year. It would be the worst possible time we possibly could in the middle of a, of a pandemic. There is um, a, a huge number of moral obligations on us. I think this being one of them, if we can support people through what could be the toughest time in a hundred years, then, then we absolutely should. It doesn't come without a cost and we don't know what that cost is yet. And, you know, I, I saw a question at scrutiny last week, we had quite a long conversation about this, but the point remains, you know, we, we will have to meet the money from, from somewhere. We can't plan without knowing the numbers. We will bring reports back to scrutiny in, in a few months time once we've seen a bit more of a trend developing. But of course, we're not going to know really the extent of this impact until at least October when the furloughing scheme ends and we start to see how many people really are um, being made redundant and so on. So it, it's just an essential, um, an essential for people to plan themselves. So people are already claiming this this um, benefit should be able to plan ahead for the rest of the year. So uh, for me, if there's no decision here on recommending this cabinet that we make no changes to council tax reduction. Thank you. So we've had uh, one public forum statement and one question. I'll call on those who have indicated they wish to speak. So first off, the statement uh, from Councillor Don Alexander. Don, you have a minute for your statement. Thank you, Marvin. Given the damage caused to the council's finances by the Conservative government's confused and indecisive response to the pandemic, 
The decision to retain the council tax reduction scheme is a clear statement of intent to continue to support the most disadvantaged citizens in the city regardless, and I welcome it. Thank you. Thank you, Don. I think that might be the shortest statement in the history of this administration, certainly. Thank you. <laughs> um, we had a question uh, from Councillor Anthony Negus, but I think he's not he's not on the call. So um, let's move forwards. Okay, so that, that's it for um, uh, that form. Can I ask any uh, cabinet members if they wish to comment on this item? No, well, I, I'll just uh, come in here then myself to just say um, just how much credit um, Craig, uh, Denise, Tian, and Mike um, deserve, and the, those are members of the finance team, um, in getting on top of the council's finances, because it's in, it's in getting on top of the finances um, that we have been able to take the measures we have to prioritize those people who are most vulnerable um, in general, but are particularly uh, vulnerable um, as we go into COVID and the consequences um, of, of the lockdown. Um, and this is, this is uh, just an example of, of just fantastic leadership and, and, and skills and ability you have within our talent and, and also the team, the executive team we've put together, um, Bristol City Council. So I uh, just want to put on record to say thank you for that and hand back to you, Craig, to take the decision which I support and is now being displayed on the screen. Thanks, Martin. In, in making this decision, I've taken into consideration the equalities relevance check in the report. In terms of the decision to be made today, I approve the recommendations I set out in the report. Thank you, Greg. Um, so on to agenda item 15 now. This will be with you, um, Asha, and this is the income systems contract extension. Thank you, uh, Marvin. Yeah, not necessarily my in my uh, my bag, but uh, uh, as you heard earlier, uh, Councillor Cheney um, has declared an interest in this. So this particular um, um, report is um, seeking, we, we've undertaken a review around all of our payment services, uh, both online and via telephone. And today we're seeking cabinet approval uh, to re-procure a, a those services will kick off the procurement process uh, to tender for a new contract for a provision of these services. Uh, the system is quite complex, the architecture of the service uh, and related systems. It covers a whole array of payment methods for services across the entire council. And the contract requires an annual license fee to the provider and card transaction fees. So the council has a rolling agreement. Uh, it was previously updated in 2017 with Capita and uh, to provide these services, which requires at least six months notice for termination. So given the critical nature of the services until a replacement is in place, uh, we are at high risk uh, to terminate this arrangement. And therefore we'd like to put in place an extension for up to two years of the current agreement with Capita from April, 2019 to March, 2021. Uh, uh, and uh, to allow us to complete the tender process and implement a new system subject to the outcomes of the process. So technically what we're asking is to affirm the decision made to extend the current arrangements for two years with the incumbent supplier whilst a new procurement exercise uh, is undertaken and a new contract put in place estimated at a cost of £800,000. Thank you. Thank you, Asha. So we've had no uh, public forum statements or questions. Can I ask any other cabinet members uh, might wish to comment, if any others do? No, okay. Um, so let me hand back to you now, um, Asha, to take the decision which I support and is now being displayed on the screen. Okay, so, sorry, I've just got to find my, because actually, so in terms of the decision that, All right, I think I've um, lost. In terms of the decision that, <laughs> apologies, I've, I've lost my... Um... It's a dilemma of having notes on the iPad at the same I, time. I, I know, it's, um, sorry about this. I'm just- It's all right, no problem. Open up my notes, because I got to do this properly. 
to find the um, email they sent. Um, Sorry, Just to explain, the wording has to be right, otherwise a exactly lawyer will come and get us later. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, I think I've accidentally shut the... I shut. Uh, Nancy, could we message, could we message yeah, the, could the me wording the, that's needed yeah, to Asha? Because I have literally closed it down. Uh, Nancy's going to send it. Thanks. Uh, Nancy, can I just check? Should, should we come yes. back to it, or, or is it, are you, is it just about to yes. be sent? Yes, whoever sent me the wording. Yeah, I had the wording, and I just can't. I think I closed it by accident. Um, I just need to take a couple of minutes to check that I've oh, got the right wording. We'll so, if to, you could come back to it, we'll go you. on to it, and we'll come back to it after agenda item. Right, my apologies. That's no problem. No problem. Okay, so let's move on to sixteen now. Twenty 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 one period two uh, finance report and. Uh, this is with uh, Councillor Craig Cheney. Thank you, Marvin. COVID-19 continues to have a significant impact locally, nationally and globally. This report provides an update on the Council's forecast financial pos position for 2021-2022 at period two. The estimated financial impact of the pandemic on the Council's in-year budget proposed mitigations in 2020-2021 and future uncertainties. The scale of the economic, environmental and community challenges that we will face as a result of the pandemic cannot be understated. Since the initial outbreak, our approach to planning for the financial impact has been iterative and with abundant caution. We have modelled financial scenarios, responded to the government announcements and waited for meaningful commitment to further financial support for local government as a sector. On the 2nd of July 2020, government announced additional grant funding. The, the council has not yet received full details of the actual allocation methodology, but early indication shows it could result in up to 25 million additional support to the council. Should this materialise, this would leave us a residual indicative general fund shortfall of 12.7 million and HRA loss it, income losses with no government support of 5 million. We also continue to have in-year non-COVID related pressures of 9 million, which we will continue to manage in-year. These costs are particularly acute in adult social care facilities and in adult social care facilities management and home to school transport. Providing the reported COVID position and government funding do not deteriorate, we will be able to mitigate the shortfall of 17.7 million from a range of corporate measures, furlough, general and risk reserves, and in line with other councils, we will continue to ask the government to cover the full costs of COVID to local authorities this year and beyond, as originally promised, and provide us with the basic government funding information to enable us to plan for the future. Thank you, uh, Craig. So we've had one public forum statement and one question received, and I'll call on these, those who have indicated they wish to speak. So the statement is from uh, Dave uh, Redwell, which is uh, making a statement on behalf of Southwest Transport Network and Rail Future Seven Sides. So Dave, uh, you have uh, one minute. Right, thank you. This is on the, um, on the um, economy, I take it, this one, yeah. It's, uh, so, sorry, just lost the seat. Um, yes, on the issue of uh, the COVID recovery and the issue of um, the, uh, network of um, improvements. We just make, want to make sure that money is being properly spent and allocated both to Weka and to the Western Gateway uh, Transport Plan, which has to be in by the end of the month. Um, and I hope that the city in its, uh, in its um, uh, budgeting is actually making sure that these plans, which are very important to the city region, are made sure that we end up with uh, a decent uh, plan for the sub-region and for the Western Gateway and the Transport Board, which of course covers right the way across from Wiltshire down to Dorset and across to South Wales. So it's very important that our plan is there amongst the sub-regional plans. And we work through Weka to make sure that we have a decent transport plan for the Greater Bristol area. And remind everybody, the comments have to be in by the 31st of this month. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dave. And on to our question, which is uh, from Councillor Clive Stevens. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I must say I'm very impressed with what finance have been able to do in splitting out the um, I mean, the costs I've looked at in adult social care. 
but um, I think it was 26.6 million and allocating uh, a lot of that, two thirds of it to COVID and a third of it to non-COVID. And so my, my question is, uh, the written question is about um, making assumptions in order to, to work that out. And um, so I don't know, is it Craig who's answering this or Helen? It is, uh, Craig will yeah. come in here. Okay, That's Craig, it. I don't know if you have an answer, please. Yeah, I mean, so I've got I've got a very short verbal answer and a very long written one, if that's any good to you, Clyde. So um, the, the short answer is MHCLD provided some, some pretty clear guidance on what was considered COVID and what wasn't considered COVID expenditure. So we have um, allocated it as appropriate. I've then got a breakdown list of all those things. I'm not going to read them out because everyone would, would die of boredom, but I can send them through to you after this if you like. I mean, it's quite clear. It, it covers everything over a half a million, I think. So it should give in, in which the case... detail you wanted, if not more. In which case they may be answering my supplementary, which is um, about um, what other extra costs in adult social care have um, have led to that difference. So, like, um, let me think. Masks. I think carers had a had an increase, um, and, and the quantity of people in care homes. If if your data has got that, Craig, I'll sit and wait for it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we've got some of that. We've got some of that. These are few. It's things like in, infection control. So there's four million for infection control, um, increased step down in bed capacity, and and scale up of short term intervention with CCG. There's loads of things in there. I'll send them through to you, and you can you can enjoy. Yeah, that, so that would be great. Thank you very much. And then I'll mm -hmm. save my other supplementary for um, uh, the next item. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, can I ask any if any other cabinet members want to? Come in on this. I'm just minded, uh, Clive, as you mentioned, adult social care in particular. I don't know if you can remember the exact number, Helen, but um, Una Goldsworthy um, was talking about the sheer cost of PPE to um, to care workers. And I, f I forget the equivalence. It was a certain number of staff. Was it in masks alone, Helen? Do you remember the number she shared? Yeah, yeah it's, I mean, if anything that indicates that a sustainable solution for funding adult social care across the country has to, has to be found. And the pandemic obviously has highlighted the issues that are raised by that. So Una Goldsworthy, the chief executive of Brunel Care has told us in numerous sessions we've had looking into the impact on care homes that her ongoing costs because of the need for staff and um, residents and visitors to to wear masks just on masks alone not on full PPE is an extra half a million pounds for Brunel care a year so uh, that gives you some indication of the scale of the issue and of course as Clive has indicated and as Craig has said in in the answers some of the monies that we've had PPE has been out with what you could spend it on. So um, it, it hasn't always been as uh, simple as here's the money, you can, you can use it as you need to. So we've been very careful and clearly keeping our budget under control in the face of the additional pressures is going to be a challenge for us, but we're working on it very hard. And I've been in a session with Hugh Evans, the director, just today talking about how we're going to do that. Thanks, Helen. I'll hand back to you uh, now, Craig. But I, I think, too, we've got to try and tackle, and as core cities, we will tackle this idea that we'll just go back to normal, having had this period of uh, temporary funding from government. We're, we're going to go into a state of permanently higher costs, permanently lower revenues, and increased risks and, and, and jeopardy. And as local authorities, that is the, that is the chapter change in the world in which we are um, going to be operating at now when we need we will need a a, um, a government that it's not a case of being sympathetic with it. It's a case of actually understanding uh, that. But let me hand back to you now, Craig, to take the decision which I support and is now being displayed on the screen. Thanks, Marvin. I'd probably just also reflect that um, you and I in particular, but the cabinet more widely and the group have, have, have taken flack over the years for being perhaps quite prudent with our, with our budget. And, but um, I just absolutely thank God that we have, you know, having a resilience reserve that's enabled us to meet some of the some of the gaps in our budget this year is is, is huge. Um, 
anyway, in, in terms of the decision to be made, oh, sorry, in making this decision, I've taken into consideration the equality's relevance check in the report. In terms of the decision to be made today, I approve the recommendations as set out in the report. Thank you, Craig. Um, so let's go on to agenda item 17, the redevelopment of the building that will soon... Mayor, sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Mayor, we can we go, go back. back to the previous decision? I've got it, I've got you, yeah. <laughs> so back to agenda item 15, Asha, the wording. Yeah, so, yeah again, so my <laughs> apologies. So, <laughs> in terms of the decision to be made today, I approve the recommendation as set out in the report. Thank you. Thank you, Asha. Wording is all important. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, so let's go on to agenda item 17, which is the redevelopment of the building that will soon formally uh, have been known as Colston Hall. And uh, this item is with uh, Councillor Cheney. Thank you, Marvin. So this is an update paper to bring Cabinet up to speed with the project and the measures that have been taken to manage issues that have arisen. Later this year, we will bring a more detailed paper for approval by Cabinet once the cost review has been completed. Bristol is fortunate to have an internationally renowned arts centre in the heart of the city and the work that the arts and culture sector more broadly has finally been recognised by the 1.5 billion bailout announced by government last week. Officers are looking, are looking into whether there'll be an allocation of a restart and infrastructure project within that package of money. Working on old, old buildings is always high risk. You don't know what you've got to dig a hole. In the process, our developers have discovered interesting features, wells, hollow pillars and asbestos. This adds to the complexity of the work. These are complications we have to deal with and there are no workarounds. The city needs to maintain a concert venue in the centre. The name is going to change. It will be a modern music and culture venue which reflects where the city is and is going. Bristol Music Trust, which provides musical education to around 90% of children in the city, will establish the National Send Music Centre housed in the new education spaces in the transformed hall when it reopens. This will be one of the most accessible music venues in the country. Once the work is completed and the hall is unveiled with a new name, it will continue to contribute to the city and become an organisation that pivots into delivery of more projects to contribute to inclusive economic growth in the city. Thank you very much, uh, Craig. Um, so we've had one public, forum and one public forum statement and one question, and I call on those who have indicated they wish to speak. So the public forum uh, statement is from Councillor Cleo Lake. It's a bit late. Okay. 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 So I'll say that again. Um, there was one public forum statement and one public uh, and one question received. I'll call on those who've indicated they wish to speak. Um, and this statement is from uh, Councillor Clear Lake. So Clear, I'll give you uh, ten seconds notice um, before the end of your minute. Yeah, I've, I indicated I didn't want to speak to the statement. I was just I'm just here to get the answer to the question. Thank you. Okay, so the question I have here is from uh, Councillor Clive Stevens. So, Clive. Thank you. Uh, so, my uh, question is sort of possibly more of a, an engineering stroke risk management question, and it's going back to the lessons learned um, from two, three, four years ago, possibly. Back then, uh, we had a reputation for big projects overrunning on cost. And I was just wondering whether what we, with what we know now over this project, whether uh, anyone, who's, who's going to answer this, by the way? Maybe, is it Marvin? It'll, it'll be me. It's Craig. It'll be me. Whether we could whether it's sort of with a benefit of hindsight whether we could have learned more about the risks three four five years ago yeah thanks guys and i'll be honest i expected this question from you as i know you've raised the issues from from the beginning i think we we did expect there absolutely expected there to be problems and i think we put something like a 25 percent contingency in the budget to deal with that because we thought this would be um there's so much potential for for problems in a project of this scale and uh, the age of the building and so on i don't think any of us could have predicted that the pillars holding up the roof were hollow or any of the other things that, that we found so um so we yes and no i guess i mean we will need to be more i guess uh take a more risk averse approach in the future but i think putting in a contingency of the scale we did seemed reasonable and sensible at the time do you have um, a supplementary clive 
Yeah, um, so my supplementary is, um, are we at a, because the council's underwritten these overspends, are we at a stage now where we know the maximum exposure, our total exposure to this project? So it, I think we, we, we probably are, but that's, that will be the subject of the next paper we come to. And, and you know, we're, we're in conversation with the other funders too. We're all in this, we're all in this one together. This isn't just a council's issue. And, um, so we're absolutely, those conversations are ongoing and that will be the subject of the next paper, which we bring later. So that'll be August, September. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so uh, Democratic Services here, we have no record of a question from you. No, how did you so how did you submit your agenda. question? Sorry, it's the next agenda item. Hopefully, are you on the wrong agenda item? Yeah, I just got invited in, so I wasn't aware what agenda item you're on. Sorry. All right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, um, can I offer this to any other cabinet members who'd like to uh, speak on this item? No. Okay. Oh, oh, was that Helen? Were you indicating there? No. Okay, I'll, well, I'll just say, to say how much I welcome it. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, there are a number of things about this that, that's really important. One is obviously it's uh, a, a you know a venue smack in the middle of the city. Uh, the change of the name uh, that we secured is, is welcome as well because it talks about where Bristol is and where Bristol is uh, going, where Bristol needs to be, uh, which is hugely important. Um, and the decision is to do something and do nothing and, and having a venue slowly uh, disintegrating in the middle of the city uh, is not an option for us. Um, so bringing that, uh, uh, as, as Craig was talking about there, the, the, uh, the contingency uh, crafting our approach in, incredibly carefully is, is very welcome and one the city uh, needs. Probably touching base heavily as well on nighttime economy there, Nicola, as well as part of that kind of collage of, of, of offers we'll have. Um, so Cabinet notes the recommendations are set out in the report, uh, which will now be displayed on the screen. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so let's move on to agenda item 18 now, advancing equality and inclusion at Bristol City Council. Um, and Asher, you're gonna introduce this report. Yes, I am. Thank you. So last week, I brought the rep this report to full council, which was overwhelmingly approved by members. Today, I'm bringing back this report to Cabinet to update you on the internal facing work we've undertaken to date to improve equality, diversity and inclusion practice, particularly relating to race equality and tackling institutional racism and additional actions which are to be taken over and above existing plans, along with associated financial commitments. I have also invited Dave Weaver of DWC Consulting to speak to his report, which sets out the outcomes and recommendations following his work, which looked forensically at race equality practice within the council uh, and particularly dealing with many of the complaints that came forward last year and that were raised by black staff. Uh, and he will be invited shortly to talk to um, his report. Equality and inclusion is at the heart of the council's overall vision from the corporate strategy um, to play and which states to play a leading role in driving a city of hope and aspiration where everyone can share in its success. More specifically, these recommendations support the organizational priority in the corporate strategy to make sure we have an inclusive, high-performing, healthy and motivated workforce. Whilst this report is primarily about internal facing measures, if these are delivered, they will ensure that the council provides inclusive services which actively address inequality and exclusion and enable Bristol citizens to realize their potential and live safely. These measures are also, um, will also help our ability to build good relationships with and between different communities in Bristol. So everyone is able to participate and contribute. We never expected to be in the middle of a global pandemic, but we remain relentlessly focused on tackling inequality, which our administration are unapologetically determined to address head on, no matter how uncomfortable it makes people feel. 
Tackling discrimination and inequality is everyone's business and it is integral to our values that we show each other respect, treat each other fairly and with dignity and value difference. But being truly inclusive is not just about welcoming different contributions and standing against any discrimination. It also means actively addressing our everyday practice and the systems that we use that inadvertently leads to a lack of opportunity and fairness from, for those from underrepresented groups, such as Black, Asian, uh, disabled, LGBTQ+, uh, young people, uh, older people. So in the last 18 months, we have been on a journey. And um, last week, as I said, full council unanimously approved uh, our, uh, our progress report on equality and inclusion. Uh, in terms of uh, the report, it's, it's details over 50 different actions, interventions and changes across several themes, including recruitment, leadership and changes to strategy. Our plans have been shaped by several opportunities to learn, including the LGA Peer Challenge, an independent report uh, by Camel Duke Punia uh, in 2018, which helped shape our equality and inclusion strategy. And as I said earlier, more recently, the work of Dave Weaver. David has worked with many colleagues over the past year to provide independent support, facilitation and review. And this has really helped us to inform our ongoing work to learn and improve our equality and inclusion practice. Building on, uh, so some of the examples, we're going to make more use of positive action measures in recruitment to address the imbalance or disadvantage that are faced by underrepresented groups. We're going to invest further in equality training and uh, we're gonna create more ways to help colleagues to develop their careers and programs such as moving forward together uh, in housing and landlord services will transform the way services are delivered. Staff were understandably concerned and upset uh, after the organization was labeled institutionally racist following uh, the murder of Bijan Ibrahimi uh, back in 2013. And many colleagues have expressed how they abhor a discrimination and will challenge and report any racist and discriminatory views. That, of course, is our duty. However, tackling institutional racism and discrimination in whatever form it takes means that we need to understand and address the inherent prejudices and biases uh, which can be present in our systems, our processes, uh, and issues such as unconscious bias, uh, and treating everybody equally rather than making intentional adjustments. So like I said before, we need to listen and talk with each other about the issues. Uh, we have, I, I have to take my hats off uh, to the staff, Steph Griffin, uh, in particular, who heads our organizational development team, um, all of the staff led groups who have been very much a part of this journey. Um, and all the staff who've actually engaged uh, with this process. Uh, the actions that we um, have set out in the report are, are doable, they're achievable, uh, and I'm also grateful for the additional resources uh, that are going to be put forward to enable us to deliver on this uh, very important agenda. Uh, so before I ask Dave to come in and speak, um, I think we have some questions, but I'll pass back to the mayor. Uh, Thank you. Actually, what I'll do is I'll hand over to David to introduce the report and then um, I will then come back for questions and statements. Cool, thank you. Okay, thank you very much and good evening. If I can just apologize in advance, I've got a little bit of a sore throat. So if I'm spluttering as I go through, do, do bear with me. Um, what I will do is, it's a fairly long report. So what I will do is just to give the main headline points. Um, in terms of the salient issues and conclusions and the top line of the recommendations. I'm sure if there's any questions, uh, you, will, uh, you will ask. Um, and what the report uh, does, as you can see, is outline the main conclusions and the final recommendations that uh, um, I have made. I was working with a small team over just short of a year period. Um, as a critical friend sounding board and change catalyst for the council to enable material progress on issues relating to equality, diversity and inclusion 
but with a particular emphasis on on race issues. It was on race issues, but within the wider framework, but it was important that there was some uh, specificity around race as part of, of that. And the overall purpose of the work was really to ensure that uh, the council could make marked improvements and material changes in relation to its performance on race equality. Um, and I, Councillor Craig mentioned the issue of, of institutional racism. Um, and uh, the work was around making material changes in a way that addresses the legitimate issue of institutional racism and institutional discrimination. Uh, what I'd say at this point is that um, you know, it's important to level this one, contextualize this, because racism is a, is a structural issue uh, and problem across the whole country. It's difficult to tackle. And that I would say um, prevalent for all institutions uh, in the UK. And I think where you open yourselves up for the scrutiny that you that you have as, as a council, that's to be applauded. And I, I make reference to that, because I think once you're able to do that, then you're really able to look at some of the issues and to make progress. And I would say that I've done this with many um, organizations and um, I have had no obstruction whatsoever. And I have asked very difficult and challenging questions of, of leaders. And I think that's something that I think augurs well um, in the challenges going forward. I would say also that it's, this, is, this was part of a process. It's not the first. Um, the report points to previous work that you've been doing uh, in the area. So independent reports um, around the tragic murder, murder of Bijan Ebrahimi in 2013. Um, independent report by Kamal Jit Punia in 2018. You've had an LGA corporate peer challenge also in 2018. So this was in recognition of the fact that work has been done, but it needed to be fast forwarded because of particular issues that were really important. I won't go into the scope of our intervention unless you want to, to ask, but it's outlined um, on section two. I think the critical thing I would say here is that our role was really to provide an honest, impartial perspective um, on an issue that's critical uh, to the council. And I've outlined other areas of interventions that I've done um, with yourselves, including such things as mediation, conflict management, um, and a, a lot of work, a lot of input of a qualitative nature in terms of speaking to all people, black, white, all of the different equality uh, 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 groupings, non-represented groups within the organization, as well as um, giving proper regard to the quantitative data that you have in the organization. So I suppose what I'd do now is just to, to touch on some of the, the, the key conclusions. Um, I, I would say that um, I, I think this is a challenging process for, 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 for the organization. Um, uh, I, I start by saying that the responsibility is on leaders and leadership. And I was really pleased with the, the level of interaction that we had um, with the senior leaders, and it wasn't comfortable because when we're speaking about change in relation to race equality issues and talking about change in general, talking about leadership in general, the, 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 some of the conclusions and some of the key issues that were coming up um, were around structural racism. And I've outlined in section 3.1 that many staff felt that structural racism manifests itself in various ways. And I think that some of the key issues around which the recommendations centre are around recruitment, representation, seniority, promotions, over-representation and grievances and disciplinary, disciplinary procedures and more. Um, I would also say this, that, that it unfortunately is the case that, um, and I do a lot of work with the LGA on, on, on these interventions with councils, I haven't worked with any council where there hasn't been a disproportionality of, of Black, Asian and minority ethnic staff in terms of grievances and disciplinaries, being underrepresented in terms of uh, uh, um, in, in senior positions and senior roles within within the organisations. So whilst I'm not letting Bristol off the hook, I suppose what I'm trying to emphasise is that this is a this is a structural institutional problem across the country. I think the thing I would land most is to say that um, the issue was really around the need for strong and visible and strategic leadership. And the recommendations that I will come to will highlight those particular points. The main um, uh, uh, part of my intervention took place before the breakout of, corona, of COVID-19. Um, the recommendations have stayed the same, but I think they have even more poignancy now 
because um, there is a risk that unless there is some real specificity around the issue of race and given the disproportionate impacts of COVID-19 on communities, it's going to have a massive implication as staff return um, from uh, the, the lockdown. And also there needs to be some real analysis as well of what are the skills, experience um, uh, and attributes required of leaders in leading in this new environment. So what I want to do is to just go to the recommendations. The first thing I would say is that the, the critical piece that informed the recommendations was the point around the need for positive action. Um, and the point that I'm making really explicitly here is that if you look at the, the practice of the council in terms of equalities, um, and you looked at the plans that were there when I first started the intervention, and some of them pretty ambitious, even if all of those were to be implemented, and all of them usually aren't in, in settings like this, it still wouldn't have made the material changes that are required to make a real difference in terms of some of the issues that I've identified for Bristol City Council. So what we're saying here is that positive action has to be something that underpins your approach going forward. And I think that has been uh, agreed in principle um, by, by yourselves. So if I can go to the recommendations on section four, um, and I'll outline just a few points under each of the headings. Um, corporate leadership. So the point has been made here really that it has to be afforded, that race equality has to be afforded high priority, high ambitious status. And it has to be part of the overall approach to transforming equality and diversity. And there has to be resource allocation um, afforded to it. And I understand like every other public service body that we're operating within a climate of diminishing financial resources. But I suppose what is being said here is that if you're to meet your aspirations as a council, then race equality is critical to it. And so it has to be afforded resource allocation, has to be seen as priority, has to be dealt with in the way that you would deal with any other priority issue that, uh, uh, that, 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 that emanates for, for the council. The other points that uh, are previously made is that the, the CLB um, adopt the principle of positive action um, to address the underrepresentation of BMP, BME people at senior levels and other key positions. Um, if that isn't done, you will retain the representation that you've got, which is largely white in terms of your senior leadership. And getting, you know, looking at positive action, action is not incompatible with getting the best person for the job. It's, it's absolutely about getting the best person for the job but it's about redefining what that job actually means and is within the context of Bristol City Council. And I go on to talk later about the recommendation in relation to job descriptions and person specifications that need to be urgently looked at to ensure that they relate to the ability to do the job. And so in everything that we're saying here, it's about ability to do the job, but that positive action has to be enacted to ensure that we're finding those people, encouraging those people, looking at internal talent and so forth. But the position of uh, the representation of BME people in senior levels really needs to be urgently be looked at. Um, I also talk about the need to um, convene specific interventions. And I know this has already been planned uh, by the council to look at this issue and what the new leadership approach is. I call it, an, almost a new leadership approach, something around empathic leadership that is contextualized by COVID-19. Um, you know, some of the narratives coming out from the Black Lives Matter movement. I think that when senior officers and, and leaders, and I would dare say political leaders right across the party spectrum, go back, there has to be a different approach and there'll be different expectations for members of the public and your citizens around the kind of leadership uh, that is required and needs to be some conversation about what that actually means especially as we emerge from hopefully emerge from uh, lockdown so there are other recommendations that are placed there that i think they're quite comprehensive i think one of the things i would say is that my view is that if these are implemented um in the spirit of its intention um and i'm not saying these things aren't going to be easy because you have challenges that they will make a material difference uh 
uh, moving forward. So leadership at the corporate level was key. There's some recommendations around departmental leadership. The crux of this is saying that at a departmental level, you must be setting targets. You must be identifying what some of the key issues are. I, I say, if it doesn't count, if you don't count it, it doesn't count. Yeah, uh, in, in, any, in any other area of, of policy implementation, in, implementation, you would identify what is required, you would focus on what is required, and you would deal with it in specific ways. And I think targets is a really important way, important discipline, and an important strategy that you use right across the public service strategic planning and implementation um, sphere. So we're talking about departmental management teams setting targets, um, identifying the issues that there are within those departments across a range of issues and identified in, in section D on the departmental leadership, what some of those issues should be. So grievances, complaints, recruitment, internal talent management strategies, et cetera. These are things that I feel should be focused on based on the information that we're getting. Um, we made uh, some uh, points around uh, strategic corporate human resource delivery. HR is critical to any organization. I think there has been progress over the last year, I have to say, um, with, with, with the move uh, to being really people focused. And um, so I think there's some really positive things to be said about that, that but more needs to be done. Um, and also looking at a, a particular approach which, which looks at management responsibility and not just the HR piece. And so more work around that particular piece and there's some specific recommendations uh, made around that. I suppose the most uh, um, um, significant one for me was um, the need to really continue the development of an HR strategy that addresses uh, Black, Asian, minority, ethnic, um, and other protected characteristic disproportionalities um, that there are in relation to grievances, disciplinaries, performance appraisals, shadowing, acting opp opportunities, et cetera. Reorganizations is, is, is a key one, a part of that as well. Recruitment and selection, um, I've, made, I've made a number of points around that. Um, and you will note that some of the points that are made here are quite detailed. Um, they may seem very operational, um, they are tried and tested. Other organizations take on aspects of that. Um, and I think it's you know key things, again, like um, looking at targets at corporate levels, at departmental levels, at divisional levels, um, reviewing adver advertisement methods, job descriptions, person specifications, assessment methods to ensure that the criteria used relate to do the ability to do the job my team have looked at a big sample of job descriptions, not dissimilar to many other public service bodies. Well, I would say that they are, a lot of them are based on the past rather than the future and the challenges that are emerging from COVID-19. I think you were to look at that, you will get the best people for the job. If you get a white middle-class male on the basis of criteria that relates to the ability to do the job, great. But what you will do is identify and attract from across the country, and there's a lot going for Bristol, Black, Asian and minority ethnic people that you'll be proud of in terms of the strategic leadership of this, uh, of this council. Um, I won't go into, uh, the, the other one I've, I've recognized is, 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 and I think this is, this is an important one, um, emerging from the lockdown um, and some of the mental health issues which will emerge both within the community, but also some of your staff coming back the impact of coronavirus is, is going to be um, critical for, 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 for your staff. And um, there's a particular recommendation here, and I believe it has been enacted already, which is about ensuring that the procurement arrangements for your employee assistance providers, that is the internal uh, uh, counselling, um, has um, Black and Nation minority ethnic people within that. And in another um, um, hat that I wear, um, which is around counselling, psychotherapy and mental health. This is something that many organisations are picking up and also in the private sector. Um, and I think that's been done. Very quickly, learning and organisational development. I suppose what we're speaking about here is that um, it's a move away from just, just generic programmes when we're speaking about equality uh, and not speaking about some of the specific issues around equality and race in a very sort of felt way. Um, so it's really good to have you know, notions around inclusion and so forth, but what does that actually mean for 
me as a manager within the Bristol City context. And you'll see a range of um, proposals around that, around the internal talent management strategy, adopting a direct approach for specifically identifying um, and developing the internal um, Black, Asian and minority ethnic talents that you have in the organisation and on the other underrepresented talent in the organisation as well. So um, those are just a few of a significant number of proposals which I have brought forward to you. There could have been many others, but I, I felt after real scrutiny and conversation and some challenge in ones as well with your leaders that these are some of the ones that could really move things forward in a immediate fashion for some of them and some of those are more medium and long term. I would conclude by saying that um, with what I started with really was that um, I applaud the council for opening itself up to independent scrutiny. Um, I think it's the first phase of really taking this issue seriously. I, I, I do feel that there is still much more work that needs to be done. There are still staff in the organization that have concerns, but I, I do feel a sense of, and I say this yeah, um, with a bit of caution, but I, I, I do feel that um, with the council having embraced the conclusions and stating that they will commit resources, you will commit resources to actually enacting this, that you do find yourself in a good place for taking this forward. It won't be easy, it will be challenging. You know, you're dealing with issues that go back centuries, as we all know. So it's not going to be dealt with overnight. But I think it does require a, a level of professionalism, a level of um, empathy, and um, I suppose a way of working, which whilst I know that, um, uh, you know, this whole thing brings risks that we should all avoid taking these things out of context for whatever reason, to ensure that we're dealing with these issues, which are really very, very important, and especially now, given COVID-19 and the death of George Floyd, and the implications of that. So I hope that's helpful for a conversation. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, David. I, and I'll share some remarks at the end, but I'll say now, thank you for being on this journey with us. And there's more to come as well with uh, work with the, the senior team. So thank you. So we've uh, there are four public forum questions and two statements received. And I'll call on those who've indicated they wish to speak. Uh, so uh, we've received a statement on behalf of Bristol. Bristol Laurel People's Forum, which has been circulated to members. I guess they're not on the call. No. Bristol Laurel People's Forum, no. Okay. Oh, uh, and Dave, you are here. Dave Regwell, you're here to present a statement on behalf of Bristol Disability Forum. Dave, you, uh, you have one minute. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think um, our concerns is about the same as uh, David was saying about positive discrimination, really, towards disabled people and making sure that Bristol City Council both represent disabled people at the highest uh, position in the authority and within everything the City Council does. And we see positive uh, uh, role models of disabled people within the council and in the leadership team as well. And I say the same for the LGBT community as well, that we, we're in a, both a city with a very diverse, very uh, high populated uh, disability uh, groups. We're also in a city with a very large LGBT community in the southwest of England, in fact, has the biggest LGBT community in the southwest of England, and the city looks after it very well. But we need role models in the city to say that those people matter. We need senior officers, we need senior people to represent the LGBT community and make sure they're not isolated. And COVID's affected that community as well. It's been more isolated, more mental health in that community. And also, when those officers come back from that community, they all need support and help. So I just ask that diversity goes across the whole city. And perhaps there's some more work there. Seconds, I think perhaps there's some more work the city could do with the diversity trust on the LGBT issues, because certainly we need some more resources into that side of the city council. Thank you. Thanks, Dave, and, and appreciate that. And and, as, and again, I'd say the conversations are here in cabinet, but we can talk outside of this as well um, for for particular areas that we need to. Yeah, be active on. So appreciate that. Um, so, uh, Dave, you've also submitted two questions. Can I ask you to ask your first question there, please? Uh, the first question is really to make sure that the protected, um, disabled, and LGBT communities are being properly represented within the the city and the city region, and to also ask effectively uh, that we have. Um, 
possibly also some positive discrimination over at Weka, because we don't think Weka is very representative of the city region it serves either. Okay. Asha, did you want to come in here? Yeah, yeah. so your first question, sorry, Dave. So um, actually only last week, we uh, had a meeting with Stonewall to discuss the next steps for the Stonewall Index. Uh, we are really keen to learn from best practice uh, and other LGBTQ plus organizations from across the country. Uh, so the council, you know, we're acknowledging there's still much more work to be done in this area, and we will continue to strive to make the city work inclusive for the LGBTQ plus community. We do actually have a LGBTQ uh, plus policy as part of um, uh, this document that is in front of you. Uh, that reflects our commitment to equality and inclusion and ensuring that, that our services are delivered to meet the needs of all our protected groups, including uh, the LGBTQ plus community. Our approach is to ensure that all service driven policies are regularly reviewed and um, in doing so, a robust equality impact assessment is undertaken to ensure that all of our services are designed and delivered through an LGBTQ lens. Uh, so the council has an active um, LGBTQ plus staff led group. Uh, I am myself a, um, a proud ally uh, and I work with that group. So um, they, that group provides a lot of support and assurances to managers in the development of policies and services. So, okay, thank you. Um, Asha, um, Dave, you got a second question or a supplementary, which one would you like? I think it's a supplementary, really. I think I, I really am concerned. I've got to rehearse the point that's been made by both Bristol Disability Equalities Forum and South Gloucestershire Disability Equalities Forum that we really are concerned about making sure the West of England Combined Authority is not white middle class and really does represent the communities of Greater Bristol. And I'd ask the Deputy Mayor if she could make her do her best endeavours to make sure that authority reflects the people it serves in the, this part of the southwest of England. Well, well I, I think, can I pick up on this one, Asha? Yeah, on. So that's something, um, uh, Dave, I can take into the uh, Weka meetings as well. And, and obviously, you, you're a um, very committed attendee as well. But I, I can raise this, but we'll, we won't just wait to the meeting. Off the back of this, we'll, we'll write in and, and press that case with the combined authority as well. There's some bad feedback going on. I don't know if it's me. Or something. Um, but yeah, so Dave, we'll, we'll, um, we'll definitely take this into combined authority. Did you have um, your second question as well, Dave? Second question is focused really on disability and making sure that disability is effectively also positively discriminated in the city and the city region. Yeah, so our policy on disability is contained in the action plan as part of this document. We are a disability confident employer uh, and it is a key priority for us to improve the number of disabled people working in the council at all levels. Uh, and this is set out and reflected in the action plan which is attached to the cabinet report. Uh, our one city plan also looks to influence other employers and partners. And our stepping up diversity leadership program was widened after the first year to, uh, you know, we wanted to widen the diversity lens and we included disabled people and they continue to be part of uh, the Stepping Up Leadership Program so that we can improve senior leadership representation uh, both within the local authority and other public sector and private sector organizations across the region. Uh, we're also working very closely with Bristol Works for everyone to support people with learning difficulties into paid in employment across Bristol City Council. Uh, and the wider region. So, um, yeah, that's that, that's what we're doing. Thank you uh, very much, Asha, and, and thank you uh, for that, Dave. So, um, the next we have um, Cleo Lake. Can you ask your first question, please, Councillor Lake? Yeah, can I just clarify, though, if I get to ask both questions and have supplementaries, because I'm sorry, I haven't been to Cabinet for a while. Sorry, do you say? Do you... I get to ask my question and get a supplementary to that question? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. What did you say about cabinet? Sorry. I said I haven't been to cabinet for a while, so I'm not sure oh. the process. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you can ask your questions and then ask your um, supplementaries. Yeah. Okay. So, um, 
Some of you may have already read the question, but I'll read it anyway. The report in parts references black and minority ethnic and in other parts BAME and also white minority ethnic is also mentioned. Mm -hmm. Can you give a definition of white minority ethnic and can you confirm whether white minority ethnic is included in the blanket category BAME with regards to ethnicity pay gap? Okay, so if you look at section 1.8 of the report, you'll understand that there is a difference between race and ethnicity. So white minority people are from a minority ethnic group, uh, and we intend to include a much more detailed breakdown in future pay gap reports uh, to provide greater insights and understanding on the pay differential. Uh, but just for uh, clarification, the ethnic groups that make up uh, Black BAME, oh, for want of another uh, acronym, is Black African Caribbean, Black British, Asian, Asian British, mixed multiple ethnic groups and other ethnic groups, and the other ethnic groups that make up white minority ethnic are Gypsy, Roma, Traveller, Irish Traveller, uh, Irish, other European and other white backgrounds. Okay, do you, do you like to ask your supplementaries or your second question? Um, I'd like to ask a supplementary, if I may, um, sure. especially with David Weaver here. I found your presentation really interesting. I was, I would like to have the view, um, what well, ask the opinion on, in terms of racism against African heritage people, do you think the council would be interested in working with communities of interest to um, find a definition and adopt the term Afriphobia? We Sorry, was, that, was that question to me? Who's, are you asking Dave? Who are you or... asking? Good question. I'd be, yeah, I'd be happy to hear David <laughs> on that. Go on, Dave. <laughs> well, I, I don't know whether the council would be happy to because I'm not part of the council. But what I would say is that the, 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 the whole piece around definitions and terminology is, 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 is an important one and a vexed one and, and one which is a dynamic and will continue to take place. Um, so, you know, and I don't want to be flippant about it, but I, I, I think there is, there is something around identifying what the problem is and focusing on that issue and dealing with it. And that's not taking away from the important importance of terminology. But if you're asking me a direct question to get a direct answer, I would say, let's identify what the issues are. Times are too serious. Name that and identify some solutions and approaches to address that. Okay, so you can do your, you've got two supplementaries in total, but you, you, so you've had one of those, you have a question and another supplementary if you wish to take the supplementary. Right, so my second question was, I'm very concerned to read that disabled employees are overrepresented in grievances and disciplinaries. Is there an explanation for this? Okay, hold on, I'm trying to make sure I've got my... Sorry. Yeah, so um, so the high proportion of cases is attributable to factors such as managers not putting in place reasonable adjustments and leaders not being confident in addressing issues and concerns swiftly enough with colleagues. We are putting in place a, a wide range of leadership development interventions to improve practice and also training on reasonable um, adjustments. Uh, we're also now systematically monitoring and reviewing the impact of disciplinary and grievance policies on colleagues from all protected groups and the corporate leadership board will be holding uh, services to count where there are staff that are being disproportionately uh, affected uh, and specifically um, dis disabled staff. Your supplementary? Yes, I do. Um, um, in terms of equalities, I still... It's difficult because as we know class is not a protected characteristic yeah. and it would be great to have more express um, mention of I hate to use the term but white working class because I don't know what other term people from that demographic would like to be called um, and also in relation to as we've mentioned the equity gap um, and also coming off the back of disability as well do we think that we would need to actually seek to lobby to amend or suggest that we amend the Equalities Act or can we 
are we able to instigate positive action? So can I just say, of, of course we can take positive action. It's embedded in, um, it, it's embedded in um, legislation. Um, I think um, we would, they had tried to put class, as you know, uh, when they were drawing up uh, the protected characteristics and a play was made to have class included and it was excluded. Um, and I know that over the last couple of years, there are some documents where we have specifically made a point about, uh, regardless of the fact that it's not a protected characteristic, class has actually been included in some of the policies and programs that we uh, want to deliver. So when we talk about being an inclusive city, we also include class as, as, um, as part of that. So, um, so well, we can lobby, but uh, we're only one voice. Thank you. Involved, Thank you very much, Asha. And um, thanks very much for your uh, statements and questions, Cleo, Councillor Lake. Um, and if I can just take this time as well to thank um, David uh, for, um, as I said at the beginning, being a nice journey uh, with us. It's very important, and we've set out from the beginning, actually, since coming in, as you cited a couple of those reports, that we wanted to open ourselves up to outside eyes on this organisation so that where we are or are not making uh, progress on becoming the organisation we want to be, when we're trying to understand the nature of the challenge uh, we're facing, we're freeing that up from the political ping pong that sometimes happens within this chamber. Um, and there's an honest perspective um, on it. Um, and that brings with it um, great opportunity because it means that rather than spinning our wheels in circles, arguing over definitions and terminology and, and, and trying to get the upper hand, what we, what we actually do is begin to get some real data, Dan, and get some real insight and also learn from uh, best practice and other authorities as well and, and take the challenge. It also brings with it real risk because we do open ourselves up um, to open challenge, um, but no organization will make progress on race unless, or wider, wider equalities, unless they open themselves up to honest challenge, even when those message is uh, received are very challenging. And they, by definition, will be challenging because no one has got a handle on this. No one has uh, succeeded. Um, and it's really important for me that we move from uh, a kind of a sentiment about equality to a data-driven action on equality. And that our leadership uh, is able to move from a commitment to having a coherent plan uh, with measurable uh, targets and, and delivery dates, you know, on that. Um, and you, uh, your, your input has been critical to, to helping us uh, do that and become the organization we aspire to be. Um, and there's, there's more to come too. Um, so really appreciate it and, and thank you. Okay. Um, Asha, um, I think I hand back to you now. Now I'm looking for my wording now. I don't think I have any wording. <laughs> No, I, don't I don't think I have any wording okay. because this this is a no, it's just that. actually what I haven't done actually I haven't invited any cabinet members if they'd like yeah, to I was gonna say, invite the cabinet members uh, Helen GT hi thank you um yeah I just wanted to make a comment really because um as soon as we were elected back in 2016 I was um lucky enough to do a bit of work with Asha some really early work on um speaking to staff and looking at our representation in qualities groups and just trying to get underneath some of the things that we were sort of hearing anecdotally back then in terms of what what the organization was like to work in and and what some of the barriers were um and i just on the one hand i sort of want to pay tribute to asha really for just constantly working on this and um sometimes it's the thing that everyone's talking about like right now and other times it's really not um but asha is constantly there um championing equality both within the council and also in the wider city through programs like stepping up um and and some of the community-led programs that we've got as well um and i just think that as you said before marvin we're now at a crossroads aren't we where i think the sentiment is is there and probably always has been for a lot of us, but now we really need to be accountable and we need to, to put our heads above the parapet and say, this is what we're gonna do. Um, and probably be prepared for some 
in a way more difficult times ahead to achieve those aims. And um, I think that's a, a, a collective thing. Asha obviously leads this for us and, and you as the mayor lead this, but there's, you know, the rest of the cabinet is is white and we need to be the ones standing up to say, actually, this is the time for us to do something different and to and to champion this in, in, in real life um, and in real decisions as well. So I, yeah, just want to pay tribute to Asha, I guess, for, for leading on this for all this time. Thanks, Helen. And you are an ally. <laughs> Thank you. Um, can I fact, offer it to any of the cabinet members? Yeah. In fact, all of the cabinet members are allies. And I think Absolutely, what we need yeah. to remember is that it's this isn't just, I, I may have equalities in my title, but it's everybody's business, as I said in my opening, uh, mm -hmm. uh, when I opened to, to speak about this. Everyone has to put their shoulder to the wheel. Um, you know. Craig, um, we've got Craig. Um, well, yeah, Craig. So, well, Asher's just said what I was going to say, actually, but um, but... I'd probably pay tribute to David because because not only has he done this this great piece of work and, and the report is kind of the back of it, actually he's been changing things as they've gone over the past year in the council and that, that shouldn't be underestimated. And some of those improvements he's talked about in HR and elsewhere have been directly because of his interventions until now and, and just uh, making people aware of things they're doing that they're maybe not aware of themselves and that, that's, a, that's a massive thing. Um, and, and probably also reflects on the comment you made that, uh, that, you know, we have to be intentional about this, but it's good to see that management leaders have opened themselves up to some very difficult conversations and are willing to change things without that would get nowhere so so it's great i think it's, it's been a really good piece of work you know start reading but, but a good report yeah yeah okay any other okay and, and let me just i'm going to say in a minute that um just recognize the report but let me use that opportunity actually craig <clears throat> to thank the leadership and management and staff across the organization um because it, it you know it is a challenge and um what we've found across the organization is certainly as we begin to look at organizational values uh we found an organization that wants to be outstanding and excellent um and this is one of them this is one of the many challenges we've we've had to take on so i just well i'm here just to thank the whole leadership team mike and Stephen and Jackie and everyone, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, across across Bristol City Council, um, yeah, who've taken a, ch uh, a challenging piece of work and, and made it uh, made it our own. So, um, thank you all for your comments. And cabinet notes the recommendations are set out in the report, and which will now be displayed on the screen. There we go. Okay, thank you very much. So on to our final item now, which is agenda item 19, quarterly performance progress report, quarter four, 1920. Um, and uh, Craig, you're, you're going to introduce this report. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to say very much. It's a report just for noting. I, I'm hoping Cabinet will have all read it and been through it, hopefully with their directors. Um, as you know, we, we have had some, some time away, some workshop and other things on, on how we can improve our performance reporting going forward. So this is the last report we'll see in this format and measuring exactly these things. And we should see the new new reports coming through from, from the next quarter. It's also obviously picking up the beginnings of, of um, the pandemic. So it, it disproportionately impacted the end, end results anyway. Um, beyond that, I, I don't really have much to add. This is a report from Nathan. I'm happy to recommend it to cover it. Thank you, Craig. Um, so cabinet notes the recommendations are sat in a report and um, which will now be displayed on the screen. There we go. Okay, so that's the end of today's cabinet meeting. The date of the next cabinet meeting is Tuesday the 1st of September at, uh, uh, at 4 p.m. <laughs>